Okay. All right, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to see you here. My name is Maureen Conway. I am uh, Vice President at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of our Economic Opportunities Program. Really delighted to welcome you all to our Working in America series lunch conversation. Um, and at the Economic Opportunities Program, our mission is to advance promising policies, practices, strategies uh, that can help low and moderate income Americans connect to and thrive in today's changing economy. Um, and in 2013, we launched the Working in America series to bring a diverse uh, set of voices and perspectives together to discuss the changing nature of work, uh, specific issues that are impeding success among working Americans, and ideas for opening economic opportunity more broadly. Uh, today, I'm very excited to say, is our three-year anniversary, actually, today. We started in uh, March, March 15th, uh, 2013, was our first Working in America series conversation that we did on raising the minimum wage, a different approach to the jobs problem. So really delighted that we're still going. And if this is your first time joining us and you want to see what we've been talking about all along, uh, you can find all of our previous conversations recorded. They're on, on the web. Um, as.pn slash working in America. You can see them all. We're really pleased about the wide range of issues that we've been talking about in this series. Um, I do want to thank the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the F.B. Heron Foundation, and the Walmart Foundation for their support of our series. We couldn't do it without their support. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. Um, I also want to say uh, some people are joining us via live stream, and some of you here in the room may choose to participate in this conversation via Twitter, as well as in our Q&A that we'll get to in a little while. Um, our hashtag is TalkGoodJobs, so please do feel free to tweet away, but please do silence your phones. Um, OK, any other announcements and logistics? I think that does it for that. Um, so I'm so thrilled to have Heather Boucher here to talk with us today about her new book, Finding Time. Um, I think you know, in this series I mentioned, we talk about work, and we talk about how people can earn a living and earn money, and what's going on in the economy. Um, but one of the things we also talk about is how work is not just about economics, right? Work is um, really important to us in many dimensions. It's an important way that we uh, c um, uh, connect to others. It's an important source of identity, of social connection, of purpose in our lives. Um, and really, it's how we spend a lot of our time, right? So, um, so I think uh, Heather's book is really terrific in bringing out all of these um, economic issues, but also values issues that we think about when we think about work and how work is organized um, and how we, um, we ourselves connect to work in our lives. So, um, so I really ap appreciate that about the book, and I'm really excited uh, to get started talking about it. So let's get started talking about it. Um, uh, oh, I forgot to say who you are, actually. So um, <laughs> I, knew I, <laughs> I knew I'd forget something. So, uh, so Heather is an economist, and um, let's see, she is executive director and chief economist at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. Um, you can find out more about her in the bio that's in your materials on your chairs. Um, OK. No, I would forget something. So, uh, so just to begin to talk about finding time, um, I have to say I couldn't help wondering how to find time to write the book. Um, <laughs> and in particular, I guess I would say, what was the inspiration that made you carve out the time that you clearly had to carve out um, to to really uh, to really write this incredible book? Well, thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking you, Maureen, for offering to do this and to the Aspen sure. Institute. Um, this is just a real, a real treat. And it's so wonderful to see so many old friends in the audience um, today uh, and people I know. So thank you all for coming, and thank you for doing this. Um, it, was, it was actually pretty rough to find time to, <laughs> to write this book. Um, I did it, um, I, I mean, there's, there's sort of three points I want to make. Um, uh, first, in many ways, this is the culmination of over a decade's worth of research and thinking about these issues. And it kind of got to the point where I felt like I had a lot to say and wanted to, to put this book together. I ended up finishing it um, while starting up, and I have many of my colleagues here today, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. And that certainly influenced the way that I was thinking about it as I was writing it up. But of course, made the timing a little bit difficult, because running a startup and writing a book um, can be a little challenging. Um, but really, the, um, the genesis of the ideas, um, and I talk about this in the book, um, many years ago, in the midst of the welfare reform debates, I was um, a graduate student. And 
was working on a paper around uh, uh, how we could increase employment for single moms if we just gave them childcare subsidies. And so I was really excited about this paper. I was home, and I was telling my mom about it, and I could describe to you like exactly the lighting in the kitchen as we were having this conversation. And I was so excited about this paper, and I'm telling her about it, and she just looked at me, and um, just, and my mother is, a, if you've ever, not, I don't, the, a couple of you have met her, but most of you have not. She's a very quiet <laughs> woman. She's very nice. She's really sweet. And um, she just like let loose um, and about her own frustrations with not having help with childcare when we were little. And um, it sort of opened up this whole conversation. And you know, as a young person, for me, not having had children um, and not really understanding just how, while we were talking about policies for the very poor, here, my the middle class family that I was raised in was having the exact same challenges, but we weren't talking about that. And that really informed a lot of the research I did over the past 20 years. Um, but more to the point about the book, um, and why now? Um, now that I'm a grown-up economist and I spend a lot of my time here in Washington talking to other economists or being in these, these conversations, um, I realize that a lot of times we talk about economics, we don't think about the challenges that are happening inside families and all the things that have changed. Um, and this is about work. It's about people getting to work. It's about making it work on this day-to-day -day basis. And those conversations too often are had on the style pages or in the women's magazines or in these other different communities where those talks that I give that are really about work life tend to be talks where it's, it's, it, it, they're, they're separate and they tend to not be seen as economic issues. But as an economist, I'm just like, that's no, these are economic issues. These are some of the most important economic issues facing America's families. So the purpose of writing the book was I wanted to do basically a mashup between the economic work that I had done and the work-life work to sort of say these, these, are, these are the same sets of issues. Yeah, great, thank you. So I'm gonna ask you to say kind of a little bit more about that because you know, I think a lot of our economics reporting, we talk about you know, is the economy succeeding or not succeeding by like our businesses succeeding, right? And so we focus primarily on the business sector and thinking about how's the economy doing. And you sort of paint a much bigger picture of who are important economic actors and how do we think about the health of the economic system by thinking about the health of these different actors. So can you sort of, can you sort of paint that picture of how you sort of sketch that out and also maybe comment a little on, you know, are we using the right measures to think about is our economy healthy? So, yeah, so, you know, so often um, when we think about the economy, right, so the economy is this we live in a country that has, what, 315 million people. The economy is this huge thing. It's really hard to wrap your head around. And so often when we think about it, I think we fall on back on to this sort of story of thinking about the economy as that we're a firm. And typically as that we're like that mom and pop firm down the, down the corner. Like, oh, if we raise the minimum wage, well, that's going to be hard on the firm because all else equal, if wages go up, then they're going to have to cut back on something or they, you know, they'll have to raise prices or they won't be able to sell stuff. Their profits will go down. Um, and that's important because what happens, the business model is important. But that's only one slice of the economy. That's only looking at the short term, um, what's happening inside of a firm. When in fact, we know that consumption is about 70% of our total gross domestic product. And consumption is all the stuff we buy. Um, that's family. So, so if you want to think about what drives demand, it's really what's happening in families, which is their income, which is the quality of their jobs, which then kind of gets you back to thinking that maybe raising the minimum wage is good for the economy if you kind of flip that story on its head. And what economics is supposed to do um, is we're supposed to think about the whole economy, both the household side, um, the family side, and the business side, and how they interact in this broader system. Um, so the shorthand of um, you know what is so often really the supply side narrative, which is this short term, uh, uh, what's good for the firm, isn't the whole economy, it's just a slice of it. And so in writing the book, I really wanted to say, hey, what's actually happening inside families, their jobs, their ability to get to work and stay at work, their labor supply issues and the, their consumption and demand issues are really important economic issues. Great, thank you. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is that you really capture, you know, sometimes with this finding time and work-life balance and things like that, we think of that as sort of a women's issue, right? Because it's, you know, it's the women that have to deal with how do I juggle childcare and work. It's the women that have to figure out how do I manage a household. And 
But you really point out that this is everybody's issue, right? And it's also not just a, a segment. You know, it's not just a problem for low wage workers or, high, it's, or for you know professional women. It's really an everybody women, an everybody issue, right? And so, so maybe you could say a little bit about how you sort of what led you to sort of frame it that way and, and make sure that you're really kind of encompassing that way. But also, like, then, you know, within it, it does affect different segments differently. And so how did you then say, yes, it's everybody, but also let me think about what are the segments and, and how did you sort of come at the, the different segments you arrived in? Well, I think when, you, when I started thinking about these issues and you start thinking about, well, they're, they're not... Um, uh, you realize pretty quickly that they aren't just women's issues, although we talk about them as women's issues. One of the most striking um, facts uh, that has come across my desk in the past decade, I think, um, was a, a survey done by the Families and Work Institute mm -hmm. that found that men are actually reporting more work-life conflict than are women. And um, this was from the mid-2000s. Um, mid and when you think about that and you think about the fact that since most families don't have a stay-at-home caregiver, that means that most men don't have somebody to care for their mom when, you know, when his mom gets hurt. Like, who's going to stay home and care for her if his wife, you know, if his partner also has a job? It changes, you know, the dynamic has really been changed. So, so A, these aren't, these aren't women's issues. And then B, once you start thinking about, okay, well, what does that look like inside families? you realize pretty quickly that it, it seems like it looks really different, right? That the problems at the bottom, the middle, and the top aren't the same at all. You know, at the bottom, we have families that um, tend to be more often um, with one earner, a single parent, either a man or a woman, most often uh, a single mom. Um, and at families at the top, you've got um, dual earners, where both men and women are in the labor market. And in families in the middle, you typically have two earners as well, um, but you don't have as many access to resources. And so the challenges look really different. Um, and you see these conversations happening in our policy debates, where you hear people talking about what's going on at the bottom, or you hear the you hear sort of the you know often sort of the welfare or poverty single parent issues at the bottom. You'll hear these opt out conversations at the top, and then maybe the mommy wars kind of for these middle class families, these different kinds of, of issues. But then you realize that they're all really about the inability to address the comp the day in and day out conflicts between family life and work life. And so there is this common thread. So what I was trying to do in the book is to say, hey, that may look different depending on where you sit on the income spectrum. Ultimately, this challenge of adjudicating between the day in and day out conflicts, there's a, there's a commonality there. And that, I think, is really important politically because we know that um, the extent to which we can find co a common universal solutions it makes it easier to, uh, to, to get to policy solutions that actually can address everybody's problems. And I hope we can talk about it in a bit. I yeah, that's great. Because I do want to, I, I kind of want to go through them a little bit in, in yeah. individually, right? And so, so, um, so I'll, start, I'll start with the, the first one. So, so I'll start with me, right? So I'll start with the, uh, <laughs> um, because you talk about sort of, you know, professional women who are struggling to, you know, sort of um, manage um, uh, these some of these issues, and you and I are probably both in this group, right, of having children, having a professional life, and sort of struggling with this. You call this a uh, professional class that is soaring above and sounding the alarm. Um, so maybe you can say a little bit about why 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 should this be an alarm, right? Why should this, you know, because, you know, if you look sort of just at the numbers, we're doing pretty well. So why why should there be an alarm here? Well, I mean, we're doing pretty well, right? But um, so that that's certainly true. Income-wise, the top is pulling uh, ahead. So certainly, those families have income, um, and they're doing it in no small part due to the added earnings of professional women. So I'm going to guess that many of the women here in suits today, professional women, <laughs> um, folks at the top um, of the of the national income spectrum, they're doing it by. Um, by, by having both men and women in the labor market. But of course, the rules are so often structured so that it makes it harder for women still to achieve. Um, so that, that's one piece of the puzzle. Um, and if you have kids or if you're trying to adjust you know, the busy, hectic schedules where both people have you know, jobs that take up 50 plus hours a week, there are ongoing um, conversations inside those families about, well, whose job comes first this week? Right? How are we going to, who's going to pick up the kids? Who's going to stay home with the sick kid? Who's going to go um, you know, spend a couple of days caring for an aging um, parent? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so they are still facing that day in and day out stress. And I'm sure every 
one of you in the audience has had a conversation with your colleagues about these day-to-day -day stresses and how challenging they are. And we often think of them as um, you know, how this affects professional women, which I think is a really important piece of this puzzle. Are women able to get those advanced degrees and excel? So much of it is really about our ability to address some of these work-life conflict issues. So I won't say that um, their situation is as bad as families at the middle or the bottom, certainly not financially, but certainly the stress that they're experiencing and um, you see some of the same challenges in terms of access to scheduling um, issues. Uh, many professionals, certainly I, um, struggle on a weekly basis with a schedule that is not only long but often unpredictable. I may not know like uh, next Thursday whether or not I can be home for dinner or whether or not I have to travel. That's the same kind of, that stress, although it looks different, is similar to what we see to families at the, in other parts of the income spectrum. Um, and the, um, the, the sounding the alarm piece I want to touch on for a moment because you know, one of the things that we've seen over time in the United States is um, a lot of leadership on the part of women in terms of pushing social policy, pushing the boundaries of what, we, what we've done. So you think about the progressive era and the leadership that women's, the women's movement provided. And in no small part, because in those eras, women weren't in the labor force as much. So you had a lot of talent that was finding these sort of volunteer activities. I see that the echoing of that today, where you see so many professional women who are not in this world, they're not thinking about work life, they're not policy people thinking about social policy, who all of a sudden are writing books and sounding the alarm about these enormous challenges. So I talk in the book about Shel Sandberg, I talk in the book about Anne-Marie Slaughter, two people who did not make their careers um, in this particular research space, but who've said, wow, this is, this is kind of messed up, and we need to do something about it. And it's not just about us. I mean, they both speak from their own personal experience, and they're very cautious to say, my experience is not everyone's. But it does mean that we need policies that affect people up and down the income spectrum. And so that, I think, these conversations that we have about families at the top, if we can use them to inform things that we need to do for everybody, can be very, very powerful. And I think you're starting to see that happening. Mm -hmm. And would you say that, I mean, you know, because I think also one of the things is, um, you know, in some sense we all lose, right? Because, because of how, whether, you, you have this nice way of talking about, you know, people selling time, right? And whether things al allow people to sell time. And is that, is that kind of, like, could you just talk a little bit about your, yeah. how you talk about that? And yeah, well, um, so as a labor economist, you <laughs> learn in like labor economics 101 um, that, uh, that, that we who work, we supply our labor into the, into right. the labor market. Um, and rather than sort of using the, the technical econ terms in the book, I talk about, well, what, what do we do? We sell our time, right? We don't sell our souls, hopefully, to our employers, but we do sell our time <laughs> every day. And some of us sell, um, you know, if you contract, like you might sell a report or you might sell an Uber drive or something. But for those of us who have salary jobs or wage and hour jobs, literally what you're doing is you're selling your time and thinking about it that way because that's what's in direct conflict with the time that you want to, because what, what do we have in life except for time? And that's what we're giving to our, to our families and all the wonderful things that we do when we're not working. Um, so thinking about it that way, I thought kind of crystallized that they're selling time and your employers are trying to demand it. And that, that also helps us think about um, a, a bigger economic issue, of the, the big economic issue of productivity. Right? Right. How much do you, are you able to accomplish in that hour at work? And how much is that employer able to get out of you? And these are some of the most important economic issues that we think about all the time. And fundamentally, they come down to how it is that people are buying and selling time and under what conditions. If I'm not feeling good or if I'm really stressed out because um, somebody in my family is sick and I really should be home to care for them, I may not be the most productive worker bee. Um, and that, of course, depends on the job. But if I'm writing for a living, it's easy to get distracted by mm -hmm. things that are happening, you know. Yeah, good. Um, so I want to I want to get back to your sort of because uh, sort of on the uh, on the other end of that other end of the spectrum, we had the sort of um, stuck low income families, and and I think you know, and you obviously have been uh, researching uh, sort of what's going on with low income families for uh, for a long time, and so I guess what I was wondering is you know as you were sort of putting together the research for this book, is there something that you feel like um, has has changed for this group, or is there something that just continues to not get enough attention as we think about what would allow um, more of these families to succeed? Yeah, I mean, so, um, of course, the, the unfortunately, um, even though we live in one of the richest countries in the world, the problem of poverty and low-income families is um, people not being able to make ends meet is always with us. But I think 
One of the things that is different is that families, and this is not a short-term trend, but over you know, the last few decades, we've seen increasingly um, that those families at the bottom are doing, are having to make ends meet in a labor market that doesn't really recognize their care responsibilities, but too often those families are headed by a single parent or by a single adult for whom they don't have a lot of other supports to rely on. Um, and while in the mid-1990s, um, which I've already sort of mentioned welfare reform once, I was thinking about that when I was in graduate school, and um, you know, we did a lot in the mid-1990s to encourage low-income women to get into the labor market. Um, we uh, time-limited welfare, we did all of these things. We also said on paper, and in many ways in practice, we increased the kinds of work supports for those families. We increased childcare subsidies, we raised the minimum wage, we expanded their income tax credit, we introduced, um, when I say we, I mean the US government, um, introduced this the, child, the, the state child health insurance program, the, the, what was called then the S-CHIP program. Mm -hmm. um, so all these things, but they weren't, they, too often they're only focused on folks at the very bottom as though once you get like, I don't know, 50 cents above poverty, you're fine and you don't need all of these things. When in fact, we need these things all the way up the income spectrum is at least access to childcare and decent wet pay and all of this. So those families are struggling with not enough adults in them and in a, in a labor market that isn't performing alongside a lack of the kinds of supports that would make it, that make it possible to get to work every day. And then the one thing, other thing I want to add onto that is this new, not new, but an ongoing layer of jobs that are unstable and unpredictable and inflexible um, for, the, for the worker. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, concern these days growing because we're learning more and more about unpredictable schedules, um, thanks in a small part to some fantastic new survey research that's being done on that. But that's, that's, that's been ongoing, but I think it's getting new attention, and that's really important. Great. And, and so, um, so last but certainly not least, um, you have the sort of the stalled middle class. And that obviously, you know, if we think about sort of the, the role that the idea of middle class plays in our, in our politics and public life, you know, I think that this is a, a particularly <coughs> difficult finding that the middle class, the, the challenges that they face. So I guess I'm wondering what, you know, what, what, what kind of surprised you the most when you sort of looked at, looked at this group? Yeah, um, I will, uh, I'll tell a story from the book. Um, there's, to, to sort of get at this, um, you know, we, uh, the middle class, which I define as the 50% the, the of the middle, I should just sort of note yeah. how I define these different groups, that um, I define folks at the top um, as anyone in the top 20% where somebody in the family also had a college degree. So about 13, 12 or 13% in the most recent year. Families at the bottom or the bottom third, and everyone else is in the middle. So that's a little over 50%. And um, you know, when we think about what's happened in the middle over the past um, few decades, what you see is that you know, we often talk about how family income today is about the same as it was back in the mid-1990s. You know, it went up a little bit, um, it, uh, up to 2000, but it's fallen back um, because of the Great Recession. Um, but that's a short-term story. And really, there's a longer-term story about what's happened in the middle class, which is that you've seen this decades long, I'm um, quite frankly for my, it seems like my, it is virtually almost my entire life, you've seen that there's been a disconnect between the gains in income that middle class families have seen and the productivity gains in the economy. And that's really important because it used to be the case that when the economy um, got richer, that is when, when, when people became more productive, when we produced more stuff per hour, our incomes rose in tandem. That was the case from the end of World War II up until about the early 1970s. So it was like both, it, both the, uh, how rich America was getting, how rich businesses were getting, and how rich families were getting was moving lockstep up and up and up. And if you sort of look at a chart of that, it kind of looks like you know, you're kind of going up a mountain, right? It's kind of moving up together. And then something just happens in 1980. In the book, I tell a story and kind of show a chart. Um, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. And um, uh, uh, early uh, in 1980, Mount St. Helens blew up. And before it blew up, it was the most beautiful mountain in all of the Cascade Range. It was this perfect peak, you know, just going up. And then after that, it just is like flat. It kind of looks like this big kind of muddy kind of thing that you can get stuck in. Um, and that, if you sort of think about that picture of one line going straight up and the other just this blown off top, this line straight going back, the line going up is US productivity. America keeps getting richer and richer year after year after year at the same pace as it was prior to the 1980s. But American families have sort of flatlined and are kind of stuck. 
Um, and that's really what's happened to the middle class, that you know, we've gotten richer as a country, but those gains have not been um, shared with America, with anyone, but especially America's middle class. It's been shared with folks at the top, of course. But um, the, uh, the key thing in that, of course, is that that's happened even though you've seen this enormous increase in the share of women in the workforce. So even as families are putting in more people, they got more people working and they're working harder, they're not seeing the same kind of income gains that families used to see. And that's, that's a really powerful thing because you're stressed out, you don't have any time, and yet you're not doing as well and you don't understand why. It's like the mountain just blew up underneath you and you're just <laughs> kind of standing there going, what happened, why? Why did this happen? So I think that that's, I don't, uh, that, I think it, we, we talk a lot about the income side. What I try in the book to talk about is the time side as well. Right. We've lost time even as we've lost income. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. The thing I was thinking about when you think about that, so that's 50%, so that's a, you know, that's pretty big, right? And so, um, and when we, when I, when we were starting this conversation, we talked about how people frame these times issues as women's issues, right? And, 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 I, and I couldn't help wondering, um, so I, uh, you are an economist, you are a woman economist, that puts you in a distinct minority in the economics profession, um, if a man economist would write such a book as you've written. <laughs> um, and I guess what I was wondering a little bit is, you know, um, as these issues are clearly affecting not just women and um, a, broader, a broader set of folks, um, you know, are there things that make you think that we're going to see maybe um, men and women sort of championing these issues in economics or public discussions? I, I think so and I hope so. Um, there certainly have been some men economists and more male sociologists that have thought about this. Um, shout out to sociology there. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, I, 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 so, um, I, I mean, a man didn't write this book, and I, I think that there might be there might be something in there that sort of seeing these two things kind of coming together and how they play out in the policy space. Um, I uh, one thing, and I'll, I'll sort of tell an anecdote that I have in the book and kind of expand on a little bit. Um, I, I got to spend a year living in the UK. Um, my husband was doing a, a degree there, and I got to go and spend a lot of time um, in London working with this think tank. And they let me go um, and hang out with the Labour Party and go to Westminster, which was so exciting as somebody who works in Washington, getting to go and like sort of see how politics was done in, in the UK was very exciting. Um, and I got to go in and uh, advise for a speech that a big and important, I will not sort of name names, I think I do in the book, but whatever, I won't do that here today. Um, but an important um, uh, politician was going to give on um, what to do about the economy. So big speech, what to do about the economy. Go into this room, and there's like 12 of us, and there's me, and there's another woman. I think she's a communications person, but whatever. But there's like 12 of us, and we're debating it. And I'm coming in with like my super masculine ideas. I'm talking about green jobs. I'm talking about infrastructure, right? We're talking about these things. And this guy kind of sitting behind me, He's like, OK, well, when we have to include something in the speech on childcare, because that's about labor supply, and it's about productivity, and it's really important. And then they start having this whole conversation about how childcare is this really important economic issue. It needs to be a part of the economic plan. And I still, to this day, it brings to, it's like you could have like, just pushed me over with a feather. I was just like, what? OK, I've not been in that meeting yet here in Washington, DC. And maybe some people haven't. I would love to hear about it. It's not that we don't hear policymakers talk about those issues, but I don't hear groups of male economists and male economic advisors talking about these issues around addressing work-life conflict is fundamentally labor supply, labor demand, productivity issues in such a profoundly important way. And actually, that moment gave me so much hope. It gave me so much hope that we can do that here in America. If they can do that there, we can do that here. So there we go. Great. <laughs> Talking you. to you, Jason Furman. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so we are here in D.C., and we are here in D.C. on a day when primaries are happening in different places and when many of us here in D.C. are quite surprised at the way our primary season is playing out this year and, and at the, just the currents that are in the electorate around um, sort of the, the problems that we have in our, in, our, in our economy and society, right? And I guess what I wanted you to, to, to talk about are do you think that the... Um, that the issues that you're touching on are, are important to understanding this electoral, electoral cycle? And are there key things that you think the press 
or others might be missing as they're thinking about what's happening in this election cycle? I, I do. Um, part of the reason I found the time to get this book done now is that I thought it was important for people to be thinking about as we're in this election cycle. Um, I mean, I would sort of go harken back to this image of the top being blown off of Mount St. Helens that, you know, for millions of American families, the, um, they aren't doing as well as they would have been doing in a previous era. And they're doing it while actually feeling like they have to work a lot harder. That's that profound disconnect between where you think you should be or where you want to be and where you are. I, I see that everywhere in this conversation, in this in this election cycle. Um, and it's there's a whole bunch of different economic issues and why. I mean, why aren't we creating enough good jobs? Um, and why is it that families have to work so hard? I think this is one piece of the puzzle, and you are hearing this come up. Um, uh, both on the Republican and the Democratic side, um, how is it that we can help families address this, these time issues, these work-life um, challenges? Um, uh, you've heard a lot of talk in this cycle around um, paid family medical leave. Um, you've heard some mention around paid sick days. You've heard some talk around um, t uh, access to childcare. Um, so I think you're hearing people sort of recognizing that. Um, and I think what's sort of exciting to see is that sense that it isn't just, it's about wages, but it's also, it's about the quality of our lives. And putting those two together is, I mean, and we economists go out and we think it's all about the dollar sign or just the numbers, but that may not be as compelling to people when they're, you know, thinking about the day in and day out. Um, so making that connection, I think, is, is really an, an important piece of it. Great. Thank you. So I want to mention that I'm going to try to start um, getting questions soon. So please be thinking about what questions um, you would like to you would like to ask. Um, uh, but I did want to ask, you know, on this on this policy question because you do note that sort of there's a lot of policy ideas and a lot of them have been tried in sort of some state and local areas. And um, I guess what I'm wondering is, could you just describe maybe one that you you think really does, um, uh, you know, sort of give a good counterpoint to the, you know, to the refrain of we can't, right? Yeah. Um, so could you just give us yeah. a example? So, um, so um, partially because I, I'm seeing a friend out here in the audience from the National Partnership, and I know that we've talked a lot about um, paid family medical leave. Let me use that as an example. Um, so um, it's super exciting, for those of you who don't know, that we have new social insurance policies in America um, that are universal in three states. We have paid family leave in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. And um, these are policies that have been implemented over, I think the, the California one was signed into law in 2003 and implemented a few years later. And then there have been some researchers that have actually gone out and said, OK, well, did this destroy the economies of California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island like the, um, the people who were fighting these bills getting passed said it would? And in the book, I have some actually some really awesome quotes of people saying, if you do this, like everything will fall apart. And then, of course, that firm is still in existence many years later, and everything might have been OK. Um, but what we see, not just anecdotally, but from the research, is that um, implementing um, paid family medical leave, um, not only there's no signs that it was bad for the economy, um, there's a lot of evidence that for employers it was either good or pretty much a non-entity, a non which is also kind of a good thing, right? It didn't, it didn't matter to the employer, which means that it wasn't a problem. Um, and what you see that paid family medical leave does is it increases the probability that people who take that leave will go back to their employer. And I don't know how many of you actually have to hire people. Um, and now that I do, I'm like obsessed with this one because it's a lot of work. Um, it requires <laughs> a lot of time and resources and energy. And increasing job retention of valuable employees saves firms lots of money. I don't want to give out a number. There's numbers in the books. But that, that, um, these kinds of policies that make it easier for people to take leave when they need it to care for uh, a new child or a sick family member or their own illness, and then come back to work, if that increases the probability that you come back to work, that's increasing productivity. It's, in, it's lowering um, the costs of turnover, which are, are really uh, significant. In a meta-analysis I did with a colleague, um, we found that um, the cost of turnover is about 20% uh, of an employee's annual salary 
up and down the income ladder up until you get to the very highest, most specialized workers. So a lot of people say, oh, you can just replace that McDonald's worker, whatever. No, it actually still costs that firm a lot of money. It's less because that employee is made less, but it still costs a lot of money, that, that turnover. So these policies like paid family medical leave that draw people back in, um, there's evidence that these are good, they are, that these are good economics, and there's not evidence that firms have found them difficult. One reason that this particular policy has been so good is that it doesn't cost the firms any money. Um, I was going to say, can you say a little yeah. about how it works and how yeah. it's financed? Um, it's, uh, the way that it's done in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island is that it's a tax on employees. So you pay into this social insurance system, and then when you need the benefit, you can take it, and your check comes from the state. So you get from the benefit program that you paid into. So the money comes from not your employer. They don't have to worry about it. And if you're sick, or if you're having a new kid, you probably wouldn't be at work anyway, and a lot of those people will, have, um, will be eligible for the unpaid family medical leave. Um, so the employer kind of already has to deal with the fact that you're not there. There's some people who are taking leave that wouldn't otherwise take leave, but over, over, um, overall, they don't actually, since they don't have to pay for it, it sort of reduces that burden on the employer, that piece of it. So it is, is it, I mean, is it somewhat similar in some ways in the way it works to like, um, sort of a cents per hour fund and is it is it is it is it a financing mechanism i guess that i'm wondering has has anybody used it to finance other kinds of benefits um, it's uh, uh, statewide um, the, the same social insurance system in five states is used to finance temporary disability, mm -hmm. but it's honestly, it's the exact same logic as our social security system. Right. Every one of us, if you have an employer and you have payroll, talent, there's that thing that says FICA that's taking your money for your future social security benefits, um, so that if you are uh, you know, retired or disabled um, um, or you uh, die and you have dependents, that they get that income. Mm -hmm. It's also similar in some ways, um, depending on the state, how we fund unemployment insurance. So it's, it's, it's consistent with a variety of other policies already in place. Great, great. Okay. Okay. Somebody's been thinking away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm shoved all the way <clears throat> in the corner over here. Hi, Heather. Hi, um, Roxanne. Roxanne from the Rockefeller Family Fund. Thank you for being here today and for writing the book in the first place. Um, for those of us who already work on these work-life issues and have been for a long time, what do you hope that we can take away from the book? How should we change the way that we talk about these issues? Or are there different policies that we're not considering in our work that we should start to integrate into what we're advocating for? Um, thank you for that question, and thank you for all the work you guys do on these issues. Um, uh, so, so two things. I mean, one, um, uh, I think we need to, we need to. So, so one is that we need to stand strong on the on the belief, on the evidence, that there is an economic case for these policies that is bigger than a business case, even if a single firm. Um, has to change the way they do something or pay a little bit of extra for a paid sick day or something, on net, when you look at the economic benefits, they can far outweigh the individual. And that doesn't mean that business case studies aren't important, but that it's bigger than the individual business. And I think that's important. Um, two, I hope that you will see this as, as a foundation, that there is a lot of economic evidence and that, um, and that we can say that feeling confident that that is true. Um, and then third, um, I have a set of graphs, and um, I'm actually excited because we're going to be releasing a whole bunch of new charts and graphics on our website to supplement the book in the coming weeks. Um, but a, a set of charts that show the extent to which the added earnings and hours of women um, contributed to family income for families in the top, the middle, and the bottom. And what you see is that without the added earnings of wives or women, um, wives and, and single women uh, in families at the middle and the bottom, family income would have fallen, all else equal, if nothing else had changed, because of declining male uh, hours and earnings. So if not for women's added hours of work, family income would have been even worse in all three cases, but in the middle and the bottom, it would have actually been negative. For families at the top, you know, these added hours and earnings have been really important. It's a slightly different story, but I think that's important for sort of saying this isn't just frivolous, or not that anybody says that women's work is frivolous, but that it's fundamentally and profoundly important to family economic well-being. So hopefully those charts will be really useful. And we're updating them and adding more in the weeks to come. Great. Yes. 
Hi, thank you. Um, it occurs to me that if I, as an employer, am required to pay a benefit that I wasn't paying a year ago, I'm going to find the money from somewhere, and I'm wondering whether there has been any work done, have you done any, or are you aware of any studies that has correlated the increase in employer benefits over a period of years, and the increase in the type of employer benefit, as well as the value of the employer benefit, with stagnation in wages? So yes, lots of people have focused on that. Um, I, I can think of reports that friends and colleagues at the Economic Policy Insti Institute have written on that very topic. So certainly that's an issue, right? Um, if uh, if uh, some advocates do some great work and pass a paid sick days law in a state like, I don't know, Vermont, yeah? So, and then everybody, every employer in Vermont now has to um, allow workers to earn paid sick days. Then then you, if you were employing people in Vermont, would be like, okay, well now up to five days or seven days, I'm not sure what it is, let's say it's five um, days a year, I have to pay that person even when they stay home sick. So how am I gonna find that money, right? So, um, so are they gonna, raise prices a little? Are they going to lower wages a little? Which probably, at least in the usually we see that that happens over time through slower increases in nominal wages. Um, what will be the productivity effects? Like something like paid sick days, which is a fairly small, um, a small benefit in the grand scheme of things. And most people don't take all their benefits. And if they don't come into work sick and they don't make other people sick, there actually could be longer term productivity benefits for the firm. I have some great quotes in the book from uh, San Francisco from a, a restaurant employer saying, I thought this was gonna be horrible, but now people don't come into work sick and then make everybody sick, so actually I'm saving money. Oh, I didn't think of that, right? Um, but uh, so, so certainly, so, but there are people that have, I mean, I could point you to some research studies that have looked at this question, but that is the right question to be asking, and then what the overall aggregate impact of that is um, over time, but. Hi, this is a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I Can wondered I if- your name? Oh, please? I'm Linda, and I'm a freelancer, so here's my question. Um, as more and more people are contract workers and not employed by companies, do you think about how to address that at all? Yes, I'm thinking about that every day now. Um, so there's, uh, so, so one question is, uh, are we, what is the extent to which we're actually seeing a rise in contract workers? And that's an open question. A lot of people are, are thinking about that right now and looking at it. The evidence isn't so strong. Um, I did hear uh, 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 Larry Michelle, who runs the Economic Policy Institute, stand up at an event and, and state that we have more interns in America than um, I think it was contract workers, I'm probably mangling exactly what he said, but it was sort of like, but so this is a new issue, but the, the scale of which there's still questions and economists are looking at this, and quite frankly, we don't have good data. So, and this is a, an issue actually that my center is thinking about looking at um, because of this. Um, JP Morgan Chase just did analysis of their customer. They have this big data set on their customers and they found that of um, people getting money from platform companies, any kind, either like Etsy, the ones where you sell what you made, or ones where you sell your time like Uber, it's less than 1% of people. So small, but, so these are all just, I'm not sure, we're not sure yet. So one is how big is this? But two, the, the real question is what do we do about it, right? We live in a world where our social insurance and labor standards were all laid out in the 1930s, assuming that people got jobs and were paid by the hour. Um, and uh, and also, by the way, a, a, an era when you know uh, it was more typical for women to not be in the labor market, and in an era when women only had the vote for a decade. So a lot of the issues that I'm talking about are sort of not in there, right? Um, and we're still living with this infrastructure. We've you know we've done some tweaks on the side, and that's been great, but we haven't rethought what that means. If we're moving to a world where we want to have more contract workers because we think because people like it or we think that's better, be it all of our infrastructure on labor standards and on social insurance are tied to people being wage earners, we're going to have to rethink everything. I mean, I think we already have to rethink everything because all the stuff I talk about in my book around work life. So maybe it's a twofer and we should just do it at the same time um, is something that I'm sort of thinking about. But, uh, but we're just, we're not set up to give those benefits to contract workers and if it's a, if it's a side job where you're just doing an additional um, 
you know, I'm sure we've all met, maybe I've certainly met the Uber driver who says, oh yeah, I'm just driving this weekend so I can go to Vegas for the, for the weekend with my friends. That's, that's totally different. Maybe that person doesn't need benefits. But if you're a full-time freelancer or a full-time contract worker, then you do need health insurance, um, paid sick days, I'm sure, you know, the, the uh, family leave, th things like this might be really helpful, but we don't have structures for that. So it's, this is, I think, the next frontier of what we need to be thinking about in terms of our uh, labor market and social policy work. And I know some people from the Department of Labor were here. I hope they're listening to this. So they're, <laughs> they're, they're smiling and nodding over there. I know they're thinking about it. So. OK, in the back. What? Hi, I'm Eleanor Lacane with PRN Radio. I was speaking recently at an international women's conference in Reykjavik, Iceland, and was amazed to learn that in Iceland they have nine months paid leave, three months for the woman, three months for the father, and three months they can decide whoever gets it. And as you know, Iceland's number one in the world for gender equality. And it just like hit me in the face going, why is it that Iceland has this? And the United States, the richest country in the world, does not. So why don't we have paid family leave now for everyone? You mentioned how it affects everyone up and down the economic ladder. Why don't we have it here in the United States? And what do we need to do to get it? Well, um, so we have it, yes. Um, so we have it in three states. But it's only like four to six weeks. So that's you know not, not as great as we would like to say. It's not nine months. Um, one thing I will say about the way that we've done it in the United States, because you kind of brought this up in your question. Um, so in Iceland, three months for mom, three months for dad, three months for whoever wants to take it. In the US, um, the Family Medical Leave Act is tied to the worker. So, um, and the way that we've done the, the paid family medical leave in, in the state, the three states that have it, it is also tied to the worker. So that means, just think about FMLA, well, if, if both mom and dad, and there's a mom and a dad, or two moms or two dads, whatever you have, um, or people caring for elders, um, if there are two caregivers and they both are eligible for the Family Medical Leave Act, and of course only about 60% of people are eligible for the FMLA, but that means that this person gets 12 weeks and that person gets 12 weeks. So in a sense, we have a policy that gives every family 24 weeks if they're eligible 50-50 split between two parents. So that part we're doing right, in a way, just to kind of flag. We don't want to undo that part um, because we have that gender neutrality there that almost every other European country did not have. They started with maternity leave, and now they've had to say, well, let's give some to dads. We've said, no, we're only going to tie it to the workers, so we've been gender neutral from the beginning. That's awesome. That's like the only awesome thing about, <laughs> about us relative to Europe on these, on these issues, but let's, let's go with it. Um, and I think actually therein is sort of some of the challenge. Um, you know, there is a vibrant and active movement right now in the United States to get paid family medical leave. And there's a fantastic piece of legislation called the Family and Medical Leave Act. It's a family act. Um, family and Medical Leave Insurance, I think the Y stands for yippee or something, um, <laughs> uh, that would provide um, 12 weeks of paid leave for all the things covered by the Family and Medical Leave Act. So birth of a child, caring for a sick family member, your own illness, um, paid for by a tax um, on employers and employees and social insurance payroll tax, just like it is in California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. Um, and this issue, for the first time in my life, has been actively debated in a presidential campaign cycle. You've heard Sanders and Clinton go after each other about the specifics of this legislation in the debates. Super exciting. So, um, so the first step to you know the first step to a solution is acknowledging that you have a problem and that there's like things on the table. And I think that we're at that moment now. Um, but it's whether or not we can push it across the, the line. Uh, why hasn't it happened? I don't, I don't know. It's taken us a while. But here we are. So we can, <laughs> we can do this you know, in 2017, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you see in a lot of uh, low-income communities of color specifically that there's people who are in this cycle of long-term, temporary, sporadic employment. And I was, uh, specifically women, and I was wondering how um, to work within their um, work-life challenges to um, offer educational opportunities, job skills training, um, while they're uh, dealing with that to, so they can have some form of mobility. Yeah, really important. And often they're, they're in, 
uh, service sector jobs, retail, and too often they're in the kinds of jobs that are supporting families who need care. So care workers, um, domestic worker, domestic care workers, um, child care workers, um, home health aides and the like, all of these kinds of jobs are among some of the lowest paid. And often they also have um, either, uh, they have sch uh, scheduling challenges, don't have benefits, and don't get enough, don't, we don't have enough um, of the career ladders for those folks to sort of move on up. Um, I think that one a really important way to deal with that is to, I mean, I always think it's really important to find, to figure out what's in it for all of us. And I think this is one of the places where it's, it, it's an easy argument to make, especially around some of these care-related sectors, that the extent to which we can make sure that those are good jobs, the research evidence, which is like piles, I mean, you could like, I'm sure, fill this whole area of the room with evidence that shows that the quality of those care providers is the quality of the care. So if those people are highly skilled and those are good jobs and they're well paid, they provide a better service. And that is exactly what those families at the top need who can afford that service. So there's a twofer there where you can kind of connect the dots between what it is that we're buying in terms of these, these, these service sector jobs and the quality of it. So I mean, that's sort of maybe a bigger than a specific. I mean, I think we do need to be focused on making sure that folks have access to affordable education and skills training. But making that, that bigger argument, I think, is also important as well. So yes, in the back again. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, thanks. So as you look to the future um, and predict participation in the labor force, particularly among women at the very top, do you fear in the future a boomerang effect if we do not change policies where you'll have more women opting out? I don't fear it. I'm seeing it. I mean, uh, so one of the striking things that's been happening in the United States, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? No. Okay. Um, no, one of the striking things you're seeing is that, so the United States used to have higher labor force participation rates than other countries in the OECD. Um, our labor force participation rates now for both men and women are near the bottom of a, uh, of a ranking of the 22 developed economies of Europe, Canada, Australia, Japan, and, um, uh, and other countries in the OECD. That is a, that's a shift, and um, there, there is evidence. I mean, these sorts of things are hard to study across countries, so many different cultural differences and policy differences and the like. But there is evidence that that is in no small part due to the lack of policies to address work-life conflict. So you saw women's labor force participation rates plateauing in the late 1990s. Of course, you saw that nationwide. Um, because uh, uh, because of the slow uh, growth post 2000 and the slow growth economy during the the early 2000s and of course the Great Recession, which you know you've seen that cliff of employment rates, but um, I there is real concern about how much talent we're leaving on the sidelines and how much growth we're foregoing. If you care about economic growth. Um, and how and how and the economic security for families because we aren't implementing these policies, we're already seeing ourselves falling behind relative to our economic competitors. And I think that is a really big problem for the United States. Great. Yes. You spoke of the significant difference in the distribution. You spoke of the significant difference in the distribution of the economic benefits of the economy. That shifted in the early 1970s, in the 1970s at, at some point. It's a two-part question. The first is, is there any motivation from a macroeconomic perspective other than market forces or government regulation that will distribute, result in the distribution of, of the economic benefits of production. And the second is, the second part of the question is, was there, were there market forces that forced, if you will, the broader distribution of the economic benefits of the economy between World War II and the 1970s? And did those economic forces change in the 1980s that produced a different result? Yeah. Um, I, I would point 
I mean, there's, there's a variety of things, but I would point first and foremost to the decline of unions in the United States. Um, I mean, that in no small part, it's, you know, it's, it's unions that helped increase wages for workers um, in the post-war period, the immediate post-World War II period, and you see the, you know, the association with the decline of unionization across our economy, um, the effects on, 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 on wages and benefits. So that would be one. I mean, certainly there were, there, I mean, studying this period of US history is, is, is from the researcher part of, a part of me, it's, it's absolutely fascinating because there's so many things that were happening all at once, right? You, um, the 1970s, you saw these rapid increases in women's labor force participation rates. It was sort of the, the first era of the post-civil rights movement. So you saw this opening up of professions to women and minorities, all of this economic opportunity. And at the same time, it was the decline in unions. You had the international sort of crises that um, OPEC and the demise of Bretton Woods that, that, that had macroeconomic consequences. You had, um, you had the rise of new technologies that a lot of people like that, that are uh, dislocating in so many different ways. But fundamentally, it, I think that when, we, when you really look at what's happened to workers and wages, it is that lack of ability to have any, um, well actually let me start that sentence over again. What we see is that the problem isn't that America is no longer a wealthy nation or that we are no longer overall an economically productive nation or that we are no longer competitive. What you see is that we keep growing year after year. What you see, though, is that those gains aren't shared. And so fundamentally, the problem isn't growth. It's sharing it. Right, And so if sharing it is the issue, then you have to think about what are the institutions that um, that pushed firms to share the, the the benefits of economic growth across the across um, across workers. Union certainly plays a role. Um, uh, a variety of deregulatory policies also plays a role in in shifting the balance away from people being able to get what they need. And then fear, um, I think, underpinning a lot of this. That even though I feel like every time I say America is richer today than they were yesterday, I always feel like I have to say that because I think we don't we don't we don't experience it that way. Um, because so many families have been struggling and because incomes on average are where they were back in the mid 1990s I don't I think it, it feels like that might be uh, uh, wrong like to say that we're we're still a, a very strong country economically relative to our, our peers but it's that it's it's that those gains just haven't been shared anymore that's really the big change in in what's happened did that answer your question <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Heather, for all Hi. you're doing. Anne Crittenden. Um, on the sharing thing, and I'm thinking, going back to connecting the time squeeze with the uh, lack of income, what about overtime? There's mm. been a lot of wage theft. There's been this overtime business. What's happening with the moving the overtime to a... Uh, <laughs> What's happened with that deal? And secondly, how much can the executive do on his own without going through this intractable Congress? Oh, that's good, great question, Sam. Thanks. So overtime um, is still uh, uh, the new, uh, uh, let me think exactly. This is still in process, right? So they've announced these regulations, and they're having the comment period. Um, to, so it hasn't been implemented yet. but. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean, so the Fair Labor Standards Act has both the minimum wage, but also the overtime provisions. And um, there are two parts of the overtime provisions. One part is, I'm looking at my DOL friends over here. One part is um, uh, if you are a, um, a wage and salary worker, if you are just an hourly employee, then you're eligible for overtime. Generally, there's lots of caveats. But then the other is salaried workers that are eligible for overtime. What's the income cutoff threshold? And that hasn't actually been changed in quite some time. So it's fallen. Um, it, it's uh, the, the, the threshold has fallen over time relative to inflation. So it's in the mid 20s right now, 20,000, $20, $27,000 per year, something like that. And they want to raise it to over 50,000 to have a key pace with inflation where it had been. So that would be a really big deal. It would mean a lot of people who are salaried workers who put in as many hours as their employer wants would actually start getting overtime if they worked more than 40 hours a week. Right now, so the thing is, is that it all sounds great. Um, 
uh, the, the number crunching that we've done at my office, uh, my, my colleague Ben Zipper and I have spent a lot of time looking, I've been watching him actually look at the numbers. And um, <laughs> what the, the, this will affect a lot of people, but it won't affect as many people as we would hope it would affect. Um, just because of the, the because you already have the carve out for um, hourly workers, so it doesn't it doesn't cover them. So I do have some concerns about how many people will actually be affected by it at the end of the day. Um, but certainly, it will mean that you can't for those less paid salaried workers that would be newly covered. Um, employers won't be able to work them as long, and they'll have to work smarter. And maybe that means that they'll have to bring somebody new on board. So that could be good for the economy. Or um, we, there's also a lot of evidence that shows that as people put in longer and longer hours, there's actually an article I clipped from today's New York Times talking about how more and more hours that people put in, they're just less productive. So overtime is is about being able to distribute the work, but it's also just like after 10 hours, people just aren't, why, why work that long? It's a waste of everybody's time. Just go home. You're wasting electricity. <laughs> just go home and do your thing. So, um, so that, and then your question about executive orders. So there's a lot that we can do with executive orders, um, in no small part because uh, around labor standards issues, there, if you, uh, let me get this exactly right. It's about 20 or 25 percent of employees are in the United States are covered by um, orders around federal contracting. Because if your firm gets any contracts, then it's not just the people that are working on the contract that are covered, but it's everybody in your organization. So that's a very important and effective way to actually affect labor standards nationwide, is to think about what are the rules around federal contracting. So that can be very powerful. Um, and that's something that can be done just via executive order. Of course, uh, we've learned, or I've learned over the past eight years, that it can take a lot longer to get um, them to change the federal contracting rules because they're afraid of being sued, um, among other things. And there's a lot of rules. So it's not actually super easy. But it is an effective tool to talk about what, what is valuable and what kinds of um, work we want to see. Um, I think there's a lot of other ways you can do it. I, and I think we've seen this you know, with the living wage campaigns nationwide, too. You know, our tax dollars pay for government. And laying out what we think those values are in terms of how workers should be treated and what kinds of benefits they can get, even if it doesn't affect everyone, is an important statement about what we as a nation believe in. And so I think it's also rhetorically very important as well, even if it's not always the biggest uh, impact in terms of the, the numbers. OK, I want to get back to this side of the room. Um, Hi, I'm Christina Fitzpatrick with the AARP. And Heather, there's some evidence that there's a motherhood penalty, that women with children get paid less than others. And of course, there are other you know, gender gap and racial income gap, et cetera. Do you think any of these work-life balance <coughs> policies could help to close some of those gaps? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I think in two ways, actually. Um, there's, a motherhood, there's a motherhood pay penalty. Um, there's also a fatherhood pay bump, um, pay bonus. And um, we won't have gender equality in the labor market until we have gender equality in terms of who's needing to take off time and energy to provide care. And so, so providing these policies, especially the extent to which they are available to everybody, not just new moms, but people who have to care for ailing family members and for men just as much as women, um, can help to equalize what happens in the labor market in really profoundly important ways. So um, I often think of a story, something that happened to me that was very annoying. Uh, uh, but uh, that, that uh, uh, so, and I won't actually tell the story because it's complicated. But um, <laughs> if, you, if you work in, a, in an, if, if you have couples that are married and you have heterosexual couples, right? You got a man and a woman, and they both work, right? And his employer thinks that he's doing some massive favor for the guy by giving him like three weeks of paid time off when they have a new kid. But her employer thinks that she should, by rights, get like 12 weeks or something because she had a, a baby. And he's under pressure to not take the 12 weeks of leave, and she's under pressure to take the leave. 
that almost by definition means that they're going to have unequal outcomes in the labor market, right? She's under pressure to take leave, and he's under pressure to not. Until we fix that and make sure that everybody, every new parent gets their 12 weeks, and men take it just as much as women, you're not going to, that mommy pay gap, so much of it is about some of those differences. I'm actually kind of speaking more about the gender pay gap, but the mommy pay gap, but it's the, the gap between women is also about being able to take off that time as well. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, do one, two, and I thought I saw three, uh, and we're going to do three, three and one because I want to um, oh, wrap one. up pretty, pretty quickly. Um, my question is a, around regulation. Um, oftentimes we see that um, uh, tax is a way to regulate when um, someone is in violation of these policies. Is we hit them with a tax fine, or there's different ways of uh, using taxes as the um, as the medium to make them do uh, what the legislation says. And has there been any um, studies or anything done on um, the increased load to the IRS to have to implement all these social policies or, um, mm. or be responsible for them um, with declining budgets and the contraction of the federal government? Okay, so we have the IRS implementing social policy. Yeah, hi. I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm on the um, advisory panel for the Labor and Employment Relations Association. I would like us to think a little bit of uh, out-of-the-box kind of things. For example, changing family structures. We now have gay couples. That's pretty revolutionary in terms of officially recognized and yeah. sanctioned. How about changes in family structure altogether? How about more people living in co-housing? Housing policies could enable people to have more caregivers from the community. Other opportunities to create work and home and fuse them. I think we have to think about what HUD can do. Women are marrying later. We have actually more single women. That's increasing. What does this all mean? So, so the problem really transcends all kinds of boundaries. Housing policies and changing family structures. We're not getting little questions. No. Oh, and <laughs> yes. Hi, um, my name is Melanie Trotman. I'm a labor and economics reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Um, my question is what role do you think gender inequality plays in work life and balance? And to what extent do you think it can be addressed? Okay. Okay. I will take those in, in order. Um, uh, so Sharice, about the um, increased load on the IRS, um, hi. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. That's an excellent question, though. Um, super important, and you know we are making more and more policy through taxation, and so uh, it's a really good question to ask, and one that I haven't thought about as much. Um, I know as we've thought about it in the context of family medical leave, there are a lot of concerns that they, they the IRS actually doesn't have the capacity to. Um, to really think about the medical aspect. They don't have any experience in doing that. So, so I think there's a lot of questions as to whether or not they would, like, could you do family and medical leave as a tax credit? Well, and how would you determine, d determine medical eligibility? So I think that's really important. And we do need them just making sure that people pay their taxes. So that's a good question, something that I will think about and look into. Mindy or Indy? Indy. Hi. Um, so Lyra, a fantastic organization. Um, I think your question is is great and so important. Um, and I mean, we haven't even. So one one thing that I have been one thing that the book really made me think a lot about is that um, I read a lot of uh, work around uh, uh, biographies and stuff around, about Frances Perkins as I was writing this, right? Because th she was the architect of the Family and the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act and the Social Security Act, um, and one of the things that really struck me is that when she was making policy, she knew what a family looked like. And we don't know what a family looks like today, because it can look like so many different things. And that's wonderful. But when you think of it from the perspective of a policymaker, how challenging is that, right? How do you create a fair, I mean, the, our, the one I've heard most about is like, how do you care of, uh, create a fair earned income tax credit um, when, so, when you have so many families that are mixed? You know, you have stepchildren or you have p children living with different parents for different parts of the year. Just because, you know, dad only has the kid 40% of the time, does he not get any of the tax credit and mom gets it all? Or how do you, I mean, these are really complicated questions. And the state is playing a role in supporting and ma making choices on what kind of family to support and not others. 
Or, I mean, we, we hear a lot about the, the marriage penalty, right, in taxes. And of course, what's a marriage penalty? Why would there be a marriage penalty? That's because you're giving a bonus to people that aren't married, right? So that's like a, a marriage penalty is the, is, the, is the mirror of the single parent or the single person benefit, right? Because you're saying that person should get more income because they only have one earner. But in a world where you where you have these really complicated and children are being raised and also how do you support them? So I I don't have an answer to your question, but I think it's actually a frontier for the kind of advice we should be giving policymakers is how to think about this, how to think about that in a way that's fair and that honors all kinds of families and make sure that they can do what they're doing while addressing all this complexity. And Good luck with that, but it's complicated. But I think that's what we should be thinking more about. And then um, Melanie on uh, gender inequality. Um, so I, I think if you're, if I'm understanding your question, um, I, how does gender inequality play into these issues? I mean, I think these issues are profoundly about um, the ability of caregivers who are disproportionately women um, being able to be full participants in the labor market. And unless we address them, we are never going to see gender equity. Um, and it's not just addressing one of them. In the book, I talk about that we need policies to address um, when we need to be at home, around scheduling, around care, and then making sure that all of this is, is being fair so that caregivers aren't discriminated against. I use the word caregiver because I'm trying to incorporate caring for elders, and I'm trying not to say this is all just moms because it's not. But the reality is, is it's mostly moms, and a lot of those moms are single moms or, or single women. And so the extent to which we, we address this will go a long way, I think, towards addressing uh, gender equity uh, in the workplace and in our society more generally. Great. OK, so I'm going to take two more questions. I think I've seen a couple of hands that have been up for a while. Um, so. OK, so one, two, three. We'll do three on this side. And then, I, because I do want to leave time for, for book sales, I know I've like thought of a million more questions I want to ask in this time. So we could go on all day, I'm sure. But we'll do one, two, three real quick, and, and then we'll wrap up. So Thanks. go ahead. Thank you both so much. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm with the DC Paid Family Leave Coalition and Campaign. Um, and that's actually happening right here. So thank you for talking about the national that. movement <laughs> and all the things that are going on. But if you live or work in DC, we're trying to get paid family and medical leave right now. So talk to the mayor, talk to the council, help us make this happen. And on that note, I'm curious about your take on local, local advocacy connected with this larger national movement and how we can advocate effectively. Yeah, wonderful. Hi, I'm Dory Rand from Woodstock Institute. Uh, my question goes back to your comments earlier, Heather, about the lack of productivity from people working overtime. And, and I'm wondering if, if your research includes some of the findings from the book Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Matters So Much by the Harvard Behavioral yeah. Economist and the Princeton Psychologist, where they found that scarcity, whether it's of money or food or what have you, actually changes the way our brains work and reduce our cognitive bandwidth. And, and it seems like that's likely to happen with scarcity of time, too. And that's what makes us less productive. Um, but it, is that included in your book or in your thinking about these issues? Thank you. Okay. Okay. And then three right down here. Yes. yes. So she's going to bring you a mic. Back to the Iceland question and also the issue about executive orders. Because it seems to me that what's missing from this discussion is the, the need for a political case for these policies, not just the economic case. And I'm not, I mean, this is not Heather's research, but that, in, that until we can show the Republican half of the electorate uh, that politicians can win on these issues, it becomes sort of a one-party discussion in a two-party system. And we, you know, I'm, and we never seem to be able to get past that. And it seems to me that even though it's obviously not happening, but the the economic stagnation part of your argument is something that's being addressed in a perverse way, perhaps, but it's being addressed. But the connections to the other kind of policies and to families, and sometimes I think I would rather see proposals for terrible solutions you know, that are much more privatized, but at least a debate about them. But the total absence, it's as if we're you know, like living in you know, two separate realities. And so 
I don't know if you know of any, have, have any suggestions about the political viability or of studies that show, you know, that um, politicians from, let's say, New Jersey could win on this issue even? Yeah. Um, these are fantastic, fantastic questions. So Hannah, so yeah, thank you for mentioning DC. I'm sorry, I actually testified in favor of the legislation, so I just wasn't thinking about that today. Um, it's an important campaign. Um, and I will say that uh, one of the really, so a lot of people in Washington work on issues that don't, that where their issues like being blocked or they're not making any progress. And I have had the enormous good fortune of choosing something that I not only was my passion that I was very excited about, but is something that we're winning on all around the country right now. And I think I'll tie this to Cynthia, right? Yeah, yeah, good. Um, I'll tie this to the answer to Cynthia is that we, um, so when I started this book, and when I started this work a decade ago, a lot of the ideas that we needed to, to implement or to think about were things that were done in other countries, you know, like Canada or the UK or Europe. But now, there's nothing that I actually talk about in the whole book that hasn't already been implemented somewhere in the United States. And that is a powerful statement and is a testament to the massive um, success and work and um, uh, uh, just dedication of so many advocates all around the country that are working on this around you know, paid sick days, around childcare, around um, paid family medical leave, around scheduling predictability, about family responsibilities discrimination. I mean, this has been a movement that has actually been incredibly vibrant, and we've seen a lot of wins on the ground. And so, Carol, so Cynthia, I'm sorry, Cynthia, um, I think that, that we are making that argument. It's, it's not bubbled up to Washington as much as it should, but I think in state and local campaigns, they are making um, and winning on this argument. And in fact, there is like, you know, uh, the Rockefeller Family Fund has been specifically thinking about where we can win and really say, hey, you will get into office if you actually support this. Um, some really amazing polling I saw a number of years ago that for me was like the massive aha movement was seeing polling around um, paid sick days where um, the, the consultant was like showing these slides and she was like, well, you know, of course everybody loves paid sick days and even Republicans love it. But she was like, this is the slide that is really like the kicker for me if I was advising a candidate because she showed how people really liked this issue and they would punish people, if I could get this right, that it would, it would be, they would punish people more for not supporting it than those who, am I getting this right? Than those who were actually for it, which is a difficult thing for a candidate to overcome. I'm not the political expert, but it was like sort of this like, wow, like people feel passionately about this. And it, this isn't the single issue vote that like say abortion is or something, but it does have the potential, I think, to really rally people. And that's what we're seeing. So, I, you know, and so, and then also, there are a number of Republicans who've come out in favor of pieces of this legislation. So there has been a conversation. I'm kind of bummed that Rubio is not winning because he actually has a paid family leave idea out there. And I was really looking forward to a, to a debate you know, <laughs> about that. But that's not going to happen. Um, sorry, Rubio. But, um, but, but, it, but the fact that he felt the need to come out with this, I do think, sort of is a testament to how vibrant this is um, and that, it's, a, that, it, that it's, it's, it's more compelling and people are getting that. I think it's a, it's a hard thing to convince a lot of people that things that affect families are really important economic issues and are really politically potent. But I think we're making progress on that. Um, Dory, your question. Um, yes, so that is so important um, on the scarcity. And I talk about it just uh, in passing uh, uh, a little bit around um, stress. But I think that, that our capacity to uh, uh, deal with a lack of time, um, you know, and the, the, the book that you're, the work that you're talking about that, that behavioral psychologists and people know that if you, if you don't have enough of something, if you're poor, if you don't have enough time, it can, it can affect your decision making and, and essentially it affects your productivity. I mean, not to sound like an economist who only cares about how many widgets we produce per hour, but if that's your <laughs> metric, then we should care about people's well-being and their ability to navigate all these things because if they're super stressed out, then they're not actually able to be good worker bees, so we all lose. I mean, again, if that's your metric, but it, it's, a, it's an important piece of the argument. I'm losing Great, my you yeah. did really well. Well, I could ask you more questions about metrics, but we are out of time. Thank you all so much. I want to thank, thank Heather you. for thank her wonderful work. And please
please come back and join us another time. But please, uh, we have the book for sale just out in the lobby. So please um, uh, go ahead. And Heather will be around for a little while if you would like her to sign it.